This is December 2nd, 2010. We're about to interview a Korean veteran, and his name is Gerald Franklin Weichel. Weichel. The videographer will be Marilyn Redlicky. The coordinator will be Ann Bartlett. And the interviewer will be Pat Perlinski. Uh, sir, can you tell us your date of enlistment? Uh, I enlisted in the Navy in February 1948. At what age? Uh, I was 17 at the time. And you wanted to join the Navy and see the world? Well, yeah, I guess I, uh, I probably qualified as a juvenile delinquent then. Uh, I was working and uh, I happened to have been working with Navy veterans and uh, they talked me into joining the Navy. And where did you take your boot camp, your basic At training? At Great Lakes, Illinois in February 1948. Uh, yeah. And did you take any additional uh, training at that time? Right after basic? boot camp, there was a hospital course school at Great Lakes, Illinois, too. And I immediately went there. I don't remember how long it was, but it, uh, and from there, in fact, uh, I was stationed at the hospital at Great Lakes for one year before I went with the Marines. I see. And uh, your enlistment was in 1948, so there was, it was peacetime maybe? Yes, it time. was peacetime at the time. Uh, at that time, amongst our, my peers, why, it was quite common for everyone. I think everyone went into one branch of the service or the other. I, don't re I can't recall anyone who didn't go into the military. And where were you when the Korean War broke out? Oh, I, uh, I had been with the 5th Marines. The 5th Marine Regiment was on Guam. And we had been on Guam for a year. And it just returned to Camp Pendleton after a typhoon blew our camp away on Guam. And uh, we came back to Camp Pendleton. And we were at Camp Pendleton at the time. Uh, the Korean War broke out. Of course, nobody knew what Korea was, if it was a country or some sort of a rock or whatever. Uh, and uh, at that point, they put together what was called the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade. Uh, it didn't consist of the same people that were on Guam all together again, but rather it was formed from various units that were stationed at Camp Pendleton. Camp Pendleton being a tremendously large base with all sorts of uh, uh, all sorts of areas on it. And uh, we were then uh, those who were selected to go with the brigade were transferred down to a, a little base that was on the beach at Oceanside, California. And that's how they formed the brigade down there at that camp on the beach in, in Oceanside. Uh, the commanding general was General Eddie Craig. Uh, and General Craig uh, had, had, of course, had been a veteran of World War II and in fact had the Navy Cross. Uh, uh, he had been on uh, Guadalcanal. Um, anyhow, we uh, so the units that went down there were, I think we numbered about, if I recall, about 3,800 in total. And uh, uh, there was the 5th Marine Regiment, and I believe there was another Marine Regiment there at the time that was formed at the same time. But anyhow, it was all encompassed within the 1st Marine Brigade. And we, once formed at that location, we, uh, one bright morning in California, we boarded buses with our field transport packs and uh, helmet and all that stuff. And they bussed us down to San Diego, San Diego Harbor on the north shore of San Diego Harbor, one of the Navy bases there. And then they uh, took us by boat across to North Island, where the uh, transport ships were all tied up at the Naval Air Station at North Island. 
And we boarded the ships um, and uh, sailed the following day. I think we sailed on July 13, 1950. So it was a rather quick put together of a unit. And uh, how many ships uh, I was on in what they called an LSD, that's a ship landing ship dock. And uh, that uh, is a ship that has probably 600 feet long and has a large, the aft end or from, from the midship's back was all open and it had what was called a well deck. And on that well deck they were all the Amtraks and the tanks, some tanks and some Amtraks, and a lot of ammunition, shells, ammunition, artillery shells. And uh, uh, off we went into the Pacific, where it took us, uh, if I recall, 18 days to get to Korea. And during that time, well, we spent most of our time sitting up on deck in the sunshine and, and probably playing cards or one thing or another. Uh, our doctor uh, was uh, Dr. Lessenden, who was then a lieutenant commander. And he was a whittler, I recall, and I remember I used to watch him sitting on a capstan whittling all day. And I never could figure out where he got the wood to whittle. But he, uh, he uh, was there and uh, uh, we were cramped, of course, four high in the, in the uh, bunking areas on canvas bunks with uh, you couldn't sit up, of course, you just roll into them. And uh, the usual miseries of shipboard life. Uh, and then we, one morning, why we look up ahead and there's the, uh, off in the distance, our mountains. And we were nearing Pusan Harbor. And uh, as we neared, why the mountains became clearer and the town of Pusan sitting there. And at piers, there were probably three or four large piers where the ships went in. And we docked at one of those piers. Each of the piers uh, would probably accommodate a couple ships and the piers were wide and they had warehouses in the middle of them with big sliding doors and the ships were unloading with cargo nets and uh, uh, personnel were going ashore and the, uh, uh, the brigade was forming. It would, the plan, as I understood it, had been that the brigade would go there and then for a couple of weeks there would be training in, in the Pusan area. However, the uh, North Koreans had gotten to within about 20 miles of Pusan at that time. The Pusan perimeter. The Pusan perimeter, so-called. Sure. And you could hear it at night, you could hear the artillery in the distance. Uh, and uh, so the brigade was immediately put on trains and sent uh, to the west to the uh, first engagement that occurred. It was, and I was, uh, uh, I don't know, fortunate or unfortunate in that I didn't make that one. Rather, my unit, which was consisted of, uh, oh, Dr. Lessenden, and uh, there were th three, three enlisted corpsmen, and there were a couple of chief warrant officers and a couple chiefs, chief petty officers. We went up into Pusan about maybe a mile from the piers and uh, we went into an encampment there which was fenced in. It was, I guess it was an open area but it had a fence around it and um, it was referred to as Pusan University. It had, if I recall, it had two or three buildings and the tallest one was two stories high. And uh, we set up our tents, our pyramid uh, square tents, 
and they uh, set up other tents and uh, uh, moved into that compound. Uh, going back down to the piers, the, the approach to Korea, it was kind of interesting in that off in the distance you saw this haze of blue over the mountains and then as you grew near Hawaii, it took on a kind of an oriental appearance because the uh, the buildings around the pier were, were uh, and on the streets in Pusan at that time were all single story and they were more like uh, what we see in the in, uh, in today like in Iraq or someplace uh, uh, shacks really is what they were and in our compound we uh, the Marines that were there in the combat service group they began a routine in, of uh, uh, taking trucks and going down to the piers and we would sit and ride a shotgun back and forth to the piers and we go down there and go through these mounds of boxes that had been set down in the cargo nets when they unloaded the ships and the green, I recall the green boxes had were marine boxes and the others were army and we go through them and we, besides getting what we were supposed to be doing, what we'd also pilfer whatever we can and could that was of any value. And I recall that we had the numbers, the serial numbers that were on certain boxes. Uh, one serial number was on the boxes that contained 45 automatics and the other was, another serial number was on boxes that contained liquor. So those were prize items. And back and forth we went for, we were there for about two weeks in that compound. A uh, uh, lot of, every night there was, uh, there were Koreans sneaking over the fence trying to steal something and usually they were successful. They would slice the tents open and steal whatever was within reaching distance. And also all of the uh, brigade sea bags were in a building there and they were being raided every night by the Koreans and I recall that one night we, they put two Marines in there with spotlights and M1s and when the thieves came in why the Marines turned on the lights and let them have it and I recall that the call went out for Corman, Corman and went over there to where this building was full of sea bags and two, I remember there were two North, uh, South Koreans on the floor there and uh, they were both dead uh, at that time. Um, that was one of probably the, uh, the one thing that happened uh, there during that two weeks. Another was that I recall a couple Marine gunny sergeants set up a tent and I where they got the paint supplies, but they had paint supplies and uh, they would go down to the piers and they would uh, commandeer army jeeps and these jeeps then would be taken into the tent and the army colors would be taken off of them and they would be painted with marine insignia and then they would be taken and sent to the units up in the, up the, up in the line and uh, that was quite a bit of going on. And we, of course, we, uh, the army set up a little depot down there where you could requisition things. And they had, I probably recall, they had a list of things you could get. And one of them, of course, was bourbon. So uh, we requisitioned daily <laughs> and requisitioned bourbon. And if I remember, we got about two bottles at a time. Uh, one bottle went to Dr. Lessenden and uh, Maybe there was another doctor there, and the other went to the chiefs and uh, the corpsmen. Uh, these are the things you recall. I mean, uh, I remember we had an outdoor shower there, and uh, the life uh, correspondent at the time, who was a, a female, uh, came by one day, and all the Marines were in the shower, and that was a big incident. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But then, on uh, about, uh, well, we must have been there three weeks because uh, one day Dr. Lessenden called us together, the three corpsmen who were there. One fellow named was Moore, another was Ray, and there was me. And uh, he told us that two of us were going to go up on the line and we, we'd draw straws for it. And Dr. Lessenden held the straws and Ray and I drew the short ones. And I always had in my mind afterwards that he, Dr. Lessenden had fixed it because Moore was married at the time and he knew that Moore was married and he was sending the two who were not married. So <coughs> Ray and I, Ray and I got on a truck in the, and it was very hot. It was uh, August the 2nd is when we landed there, so it would be mid-August of 1950 and Ray and I got on a truck that was loaded with boxes and uh, there were a couple war correspondents up there on top too and we made ourselves as comfortable as possible on these boxes and away we went. Um, we went up to maybe 30 miles north where the brigade had now come back from uh, the first engagement and they were no, yeah, the first engagement, which was called the first Nactong. The Nactong was a river uh, that formed the front line uh, where the Marines had stopped on the first engagement and pushed the, go pardon me, the North Koreans back to that river. And Nactong is a large river that runs north and south, and then as you get up about 20 miles to the north, uh, it, goes to the east around uh, a town called Teju. Uh, about maybe 20 miles north of Pusan and then uh, about 15 miles east of the Naktong was is a town called Muryang, M-I-R-Y-A-N-G. And the uh, brigade had come back to that area uh, which was an area that uh, was full of uh, large pine trees. It was a lovely place. It had a, there was a river running by that was very shallow and it had pebbles, pebbles on the bottom of it. And it was a fast running river. And uh, the Marines had staked out around the palm tree, around the area where I set up our uh, pup tents and, uh, and had formed little groups around very in the area and a lot of the Marines were in the river washing their clothes or bathing when we arrived and our truck pulled up <laughs> and uh, I recall a, a fella came over who I don't know what his rank was but he was in Dunbarese and we just wore well, uh, he came over and he had a dungaree cap on and he had his World War II ribbons on top of the dungaree cap. And I recall he named him, his name was Ski. And he looked, I remember that he looked, had a wild look in his eye. Uh, he was pretty loose. You formed the opinion immediately that this guy's you know, a little bit nuts maybe. And he said, uh, all right, come on with me. Get down off of there. Uh, you'll be okay once you get your ass shot off a little bit. <laughs> and and uh, we went, and we were at Miriang there with that was we were with the first battalion, the fifth Marines, and I was assigned to the aid station, battalion aid station. Well, Ray. Uh, was assigned to Baker Company of the 1st Marines, or the 5th Marines, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. Uh, our uniform at the time was Marine dungarees, dungaree jacket that had two big pockets on it, uh, pants with big pockets, 
um, in our leggings. The Marines wore leggings. And in the leggings, you would keep your toothbrush, maybe a pencil. And you wore a, uh, a combat a belt, a web belt with hooks on it. And you'd have uh, uh, one little patch of pockets, or what would they be? Gosh, well, anyhow, these things would be on your belt, and you could put can of, uh, you could put toothpaste in them, you put soap in them. That's the way you kept that, and then you wore a towel around your neck. And that was the, and then you had a, a poncho on the back of your belt. And that was the uniform. Uh, you had all, and then in your helmet, in your helmet liner, you kept some stationary so you could write and uh, that was the uniform uh, we were uh, that's what we wore um, where am I going here that was about uh, come about September the 2nd must have been close to September the 2nd, 1950. We had been in Maryang in the rest area there for maybe a week. And one morning they put us on trucks and uh, we started going west. It seems that the North Koreans had come across the Naktong again and the army had fallen back. And uh, the Marines, the brigade was going up there to push the North Koreans back across the Naktong. And uh, we rode on trucks on September the 2nd, 1950, uh, on the dirt roads. Everybody was caked with dust. Uh, dust would get, road dust would get, cover everything. Face, arms, uh, everything. And uh, then we got off the trucks in the afternoon of the 2nd and we were at an area where there was a big field on the left and mountains on the right, mountains on the left, mountains ahead of us. And the uh, um, area we went into there for the night, we took our, took our ponchos and with your poncho you'd get another marine and you'd put your two ponchos together and you make a little pup tent and you crawl in there for the night. And which is what we did, and we stayed in that field that night. <coughs> and uh, uh, before dawn, maybe, I don't know, three or four o'clock in the morning, perhaps, why the word went out to saddle up, saddle up, saddle up. And everybody got their, rolled up their tents, and, uh, and I remember a sergeant came by gave everybody a candy bar so you knew that something was going on <laughs> because they weren't that generous. Uh, and we started walking to the west in, in file along each side of the road in the dark and we could hear uh, people off on the right and the left and these were refugees who were, who were there and we could hear voices and uh, mumbling, and then uh, as the dawn came, where well, you could see the people coming towards you on the road, the refugees, and they uh, were all dressed in white, and they were carrying their kids and bundles. And, and I recall that, that, uh, that one lady came by, and she had a baby, and her little boy, or well, I guess it was a boy, and he had a wound that we treated on the run and uh, we continued to walk to the west and now we came our this is a little aid station group we've got a jeep and we got a jeep ambulance and we got uh, three corpsmen two corpsmen myself and Ray and we have a doctor who is a JG 
uh, Lieutenant JG, and there was a chief and uh, a first class corpsman named Boyle. And we traveled as a little unit. And we came to the top of a large hill and, and looked down to the west and we, it was like <laughs> Hollywood couldn't have done a better job of it. It was a panoramic view of a battle going on. <laughs> there were, there's a town down there and it was a town called Young Sang, and uh, there was a river running through the town from north to south, and the town itself was small, but it had those same stucco low buildings in it with uh, doors covered by rice mats. And uh, down in the town, you could see the, the infantry was moving through the town, the tanks were in town. The tanks were firing, and on the hill behind, the the North Koreans were retreating up the hill. And we had Marine air support at the time. We had the air wing had Corsairs, the gull wing plane, and uh, the Corsairs would come in. It was sunny day, bright sunny day, and it was almost like a movie. Uh, and uh, the Corsairs would come in and they would strafe and they would drop napalm. And when the napalm, I remember seeing the, when the napalm hit the hills, the whole hill would be on fire immediately. Uh, and uh, that went on, I don't know how long that went on. The, the, we, the Marines had moved into the town and out and we were, we were probably a quarter of a mile behind. And then we went went down into the town, and the afternoon came, <laughs> and uh, it clouded over, and it began to rain, and that prevented the corsairs from coming in, so there was no more air cover, and uh, that was our first experience with uh, live shells because we for we. we started getting hit by mortars uh, and everybody, I don't know if they reacted like me or not, but I couldn't figure out what it was at first. And then we realized that there were mortars coming in and then we went up against the wall and then you realize this isn't going to do me any good because there's no way to hide. So we retraced our route and went back down into Yongsang where the river was and there was a bridge across the river. And uh, there was a building on the south side of the bridge that had a low, uh, must have been a corrugated steel roof. And it uh, was another one of those stucco buildings, very low. And inside there were rice bags, bags of rice or something, bags of something piled up along the walls. And so we moved into that building with the, the doctor, um, uh, the corpsman, Boyle was there, the chief was there, uh, I was there. I can't remember any other corpsman there at the time. But anyhow, we were in that building and it was night was coming and then the mortars continued and then they, they uh, North Koreans had a, I was told later it was an anti-aircraft gun that they were using as artillery. But it, shells began to come in, evidently they were aiming for the bridge and we were right next to it. And the shells uh, would scream as they came in and a very loud piercing scream and then suddenly there would be silence and then there'd be a hell of an explosion. And the, then the shrapnel would rain down on the roof and, uh, uh, and everybody was on the, on the ground. Uh, we, we had stretchers in there, we had wounded Marines in there, treating them at the same time that we were, had our noses in the dirt with our, under our helmets. And the, uh, I recall the only guy that would get up on his feet was Boyle. The doctor, he found a little alcove 
which was uh, surrounded by uh, these bags of rice, and that's where the doctor was. But he must have come out because there were. I remember carrying somebody's leg outside and throwing it away. And uh, so the doctor must have amputated, I suppose, unless Boyle did. I don't know who. But Boyle was the only one I remember that was that was brave enough to stand up. I recall that I, I thought my whole body was under my helmet. Uh, that went on. That went on all night. Uh, and uh, and then. Uh, the door opened a crack, and I realized that it's a light out. There's some light coming out, and I realized, hey, man, we survived. I couldn't believe it for a while. And then, uh, and then the artillery stopped, and the, and the course air start coming back in. And so we had air, air supremacy. We had no, no problem with that. And the course airs were doing their job, and the Marines had moved up. We're starting to move up again, so we started to move up again, and we got in our jeeps and our started across the bridge and up the road to the west. And we I remember there was a curve in the road that went the cur left curve in the road that went down for about a quarter of a mile before it turned west again. <coughs> and we're down that walking along that road where there were dead American soldiers in the ditches and uh, down at the end of the road there was a, a North Korean machine gun emplacement with two machine gunners with sandbags around them facing up the road and it looked to me like probably what had happened to them was a, a tank came around that curve and they were totally they must have just been totally surprised to see a tank there facing them. But the one I remember didn't have a face anymore. And they were all dead, of course. And then there were dead North Koreans laying in, in a kind of a firing line, like as though they had uh, taken positions there uh, to uh, fire. They were in their prone position. And they were all laying there dead in, in a row. And uh, it would seem strange that uh, they wouldn't have run or done anything else, but um, so we continued on. <laughs> and uh, daylight came and it was sunny. And we went, continued on to the west. And there was a gully, I remember, on the left side of the road, it was a sandy gully. And uh, we all, we hadn't slept all night, so we hadn't slept for, I don't know, for quite a while. So everybody went into this gully and we all laid down and were sleeping. <laughs> and it was sunshine and uh, uh, next thing I knew, I, somebody was kicking me on the shoe, on my boot. And I woke up and looked up and there was General Craig standing there. And with his uh, colonel, his aide, and uh, I remember he asked me, where's your doctor? And I pointed up in the gully and they went up there, got the doctor back on his feet and started us moving again. <laughs> and uh, General Craig uh, uh, was right there uh, all the time. Uh, so. That was, uh, then on the next day we were, or that afternoon I guess it was, we were on that same road going west, and the, uh, I remember Baker Company of the 1st Marines was on our left on the road, and that's where Ray was uh, a corpsman, and uh, Ike Felton was the CEO of that company, captain at the time. He retired as a colonel. And uh, on the right of us was uh, another of the uh, companies, the rifle companies. And uh, we were moving up the road. I don't remember, there, there were mortars at that time, but I don't remember any rifle fire or anything. Uh, 
I remember we came alongside the, well, on the I, I spotted a uh, Russian made submachine gun on the side of the road. So I stopped and picked it up. I, I thought, well, this will make a nice souvenir. I took my helmet off and I put some gasoline in my helmet and I was cleaning up this this submachine gun when suddenly well, we started getting a hell of a bunch of martyrs coming in. So I dropped the machine gun and emptied my helmet, put it back on, and we continued up the road. But uh, the next thing, it, it was raining again. And the, um, uh, we came to a, we stopped at a, you know, parking lot off to the right. There was a lot with head ditches on both sides and there was a building in the back of the lot that probably had been a school. It was a one-story building. And uh, the mortar started coming in and there was a big truck parked in the, in the middle of the parking lot or in the middle of this lot. And the mortar started coming in again and everybody went for the ditches and there were civilians in the ditches. So we were throwing the civilians out of the ditches and getting in the ditches ourselves. And uh, after a while, well, that stopped. And we went inside the building. And later I found out that, or somebody told me, that the truck that was parked in the middle between the two ditches was an ammunition truck. And <laughs> had they been, uh, so we were lucky. And anyhow, I remember we went into that building. I don't know. And uh, uh, in that building, I remember, there were tables, like this table, a little longer, wooden tables, probably a school. And they, uh, we put the stretchers on the tables, and uh, the mortars would come in, and they, they blasted the windows out. And uh, uh, I recall there was, there, was, there was one young fella, I was 20 years old at the time, and now this fella, he must have been 17, I guess, because if you had to be 18 to be on the line in the Marines, and he was not on the line, he was traveling with us, but he was a young Marine, and he looked like a kid, I remember, very youthful. And he was having the time of his life. He was having one hell of a good time. He was running around in these villages with his M1 carbine and flipping open the doors and scaring the hell out of the occupants of these little houses. And uh, he was sitting, I remember, he was, he was sitting on the end of the table with his legs going back and forth, uh, humming or whatever, while the mortars were coming in and everybody else was on the deck. Uh, so, um, <laughs> you only remember those funny little things, I guess. But uh, we must have been that night that we moved further up, and nighttime came, and uh, <coughs> we were just behind the line. Uh, the Marines were on the, on the top of the hills on our left and on our right. And uh, I remember finding a dugout or, or a uh, foxhole off to the right on the side of the hill. Somebody had done the digging already and there was a rice mat in there. So that's where I stayed that night. And uh, the North Koreans were down on the other side of the hill, and so we, we had entertainment all night. We had, you doze off a little bit, and then you wake up in the head, and tracers would be going over your head, streams of tracers. They were trying to get the, the machine gunners who were up on the ridge of the hill. There was a machine gun company up there, and that's who the North Koreans were trying to hit. Um, and uh, it would get quiet again, and then a star shell would go off and light up everything around you for a few seconds. And then a, uh, 
there was a little plane flying around all night. You could hear its motor and then it would go off and come back and it, North Korean, it couldn't have been North Korean, it must have been one of our spotter planes working for the uh, ground. And uh, there, I don't remember there being a hell of a lot of heavy fighting going on uh, during the night there. The morning, I crawled up to the top of the hill and the machine gunners were up there with their machine guns. And the North Koreans were down in the valley. You could see them running around down there, but I think they were out of range. And the uh, thing I remember was the expressions on the faces of the machine gunners. Uh, every one of them had a they look at me and they're like, who the hell are you? What are you doing here? Uh, and every one of them had a kind of a, a blank expression. And uh, I guess, I don't know, I've heard, I've heard the expression thousand yard stare. I don't know if that was that what it was or not, but it stuck in my mind, the expression on their faces. They had been up all night firing, of course, so I guess that's what you look like in the morning. But, um, I'll rattle on. Uh, the following day, we, we moved up further, and uh, we were getting closer to the Nactuan River, and the North Koreans were falling back. And uh, I don't remember there being many casualties. Um, In the afternoon, it always seemed like it was raining in the afternoon. In the afternoon, the word spread that the Marines were going to fall back and the Army, another Army unit, was coming out. And uh, we were in another building off the side of the road. And we had our uh, Jeep ambulance outside and we had acquired a army trailer for our jeep and the uh, uh, mortars were, were coming in and uh, everybody was down flat and uh, when the word came that we were leaving why uh, I th another corpsman and myself decided well what the hell if we got orders to leave let's get the hell out of here so we made for the door and we got, uh, we hooked up the trailer to the Jeep and got the, uh, loaded the supplies onto the trailer and the Jeep and then everybody came piling out and we got in our Jeeps and started back to the east. And that scene there was one out of, uh, uh, that you remember because there were, it was raining, dark, uh, uh, so army troops were walking up the road. Every, there was a lot of activity going on, but everything, there was a quietness about it all. How everything can go on like that and still be quiet. And the, uh, uh, the army troops were in file and they were walking up and Marines were coming back down and there were trucks going up either, either way and there were civilian refugees mixed in. So we started back down the road and we about, went back down to the east <coughs> and that was the end of the second battle of the Nactong. The, uh, that was the final battle that the brigade fought down south in the, in the Pusan perimeter. The, the North Koreans had been driven back to the Nakton River, and it was get, it was getting around September the eighth or so. And meanwhile, while all of this has been going on, out at sea, coming towards Korea was the full 1st Marine Division on ships. And uh, 
were they uh, headed for Inchon? They were headed for Inchon, and we were down, and we went back down the roads, and we went to Mason, and we went back to an area they call the, the Bean Patch, which is where this picture was taken that I had. Uh, let's see, it's just a group. It's the, it's the first battalion aid station group and some others, company corpsmen, who gathered down in that field at Mason when we came back down from the, from the uh, second act on. And uh, I'm in there somewhere. And a bunch of Corbin, um, Dick Buckley, he was a rifle comp company corpsman. Arndt was a rifle company corpsman. Paycheck was a rifle company corpsman. Ray was uh, with Baker Company. And there's a book that I have a copy of. It's called uh, This Is War. And it's photographs that were taken by David Duncan of Life Magazine during that engagement, that second act one. And in one of the pictures in there is where uh, we were on that af last afternoon, and Ray is standing next to Ike Fenton. And Ike Fenton has got his hands like this because he's getting close to being out of ammunition. And Ray has got a a million dollar wound. He got shot in the right shoulder and came out right, just right through his shoulder. And he's standing there. And uh, there's a lot of other pictures in that book. It's, an error. it's I'm sure it's, you know, available somewhere. But So anyhow, we were at Mason in the bean patch, a large open area. Um, and the 1st Marine Division was coming on ships. The 1st Provisional Marine Brigade was about to end. It was going to terminate and it was going to become a part of the 1st Marine Division. It became the 5th Marine Regiment of the 1st Marine Division. Uh, and Inchon was coming up in a week or two. Well, 15th of October, 15th of September is when the Inchon invasion took place. I've been sorry. I didn't make that. I didn't make that show. Uh, I kind of wish I had because it was, the resistance was light, and I would not have been anywhere near the first wave. So, with the group that I was with then, because I was transferred back to my original outfit, the combat service group. Uh, so, instead of going to Inchon. I became part of a working party that took all the brigade sea bags over to Kobe, Japan, and uh, I don't know, I don't know why, but nobody, I'm sure, ever saw their sea bag again, or where they ever went. Who knows? But uh, we were in Kobe when on the 15th of September, and. Uh, we then flew back on a, uh, whoever was in that working party, and I remember Moore was in that working party with me. So he was the corpsman that we left behind at Pusan. And um, we flew back and Kimpo Airport had already been secured because we landed at Kimpo. <coughs> Kimpo Airport is the airport at Seoul. Uh, west of Seoul, uh, there's another little city in between Incheon and Seoul, Yangdong Po or something. So we returned and our everybody was back at Incheon. And we were, we lived in uh, a warehouse there on, uh, kept uh, pads together. Rice pads is what we usually lived on, slept on, and that's where I, I got my souvenir sword. Somebody gave me a sword. One of my buddies uh, had apparently picked up a couple swords, so he gave me one, and I've still got it. Um, and uh, Seoul had been was being taken right at that time. The Marines were were in Seoul. 
And then they came back down to Inchon. And there were a few days there where uh, we explored the area a little bit. I remember we, a group of us went into Seoul. I don't know how we got across the Han River because the Han River bridges were all blown out. But we did. They must have been a temporary bridge there of some sort. And we went into Seoul and we went up to where the palace was. Or there's a big building, you know, it's, it's the president's palace or the capitol building or what it is, but it's in a number of pictures. It has a couple big wings and all the windows were blown out of course and it was all black. The whole thing had burned so there was blackness all over. And, but I recall that on the grounds next to that palace were a number of little pagoda-like buildings which evidently were buildings that belonged to a museum. And we went poking around there looking for souvenirs until some South, South Korean troops came up and drove us off. Mm. And we never did get any souvenirs there. And then we went back down to Incheon and at Incheon, uh, about the 7th of, I put it at maybe the 6th or 7th of October, 1950. Uh, the Seoul had been secured. That area was secured. The Marines all loaded aboard transports, ships, uh, AKAs they called them. We went on an AKA transport ship. There were uh, I don't know how many of them, there was quite a fleet of them. But we were on one, excuse me, and we were assigned then to an assault group. And uh, with a few more different corpsmen. And we uh, sailed from Incheon around south, around Korea, and up the east coast of Korea. Uh, the plan was to invade a place called Wonsan up in North Korea, port city. And uh, from that point on, at, we sailed up and down the east coast of Korea for a week. Um, the reason given was that they were clearing mines in that area. And they, and they had held off on, it, on an invasion or an assault landing. And the, uh, uh, and in the evening we'd be up near Wonsan. In daylight, next morning we'd be down by Pusan. Next evening we'd be up at Wonsan. That went on for a week back and forth. And then finally we we did go ashore, and we went ashore on the 15th of uh, October. Uh, fortunately for us, the South Korean army had come through there ahead of us and had driven the North Koreans north, and so we had an unopposed landing. And there was a large beach, um, probably a mile long sand beach, nice looking beach, uh, and we went ashore on that beach in our landing craft. Uh, I recall we were, we, we were in small groups, assault teams they called them, and they gave, it, uh, gave us each a ration, a box that had enough rations for three days, assault rations. And there was a kid named Smolensky who was from uh, Chicago, or north of Chicago. Uh, and uh, Smolensky was kind of a, a fumbler. He kind of didn't, it was always a little bit off somehow. And uh, Smolensky carried our rations as when we went over the side of the ship and down the cargo net into the boats. <laughs> and Smolensky's foot went through one of the holes in the cargo net and naturally he flipped over and all the rations went into the ocean. 
and Smolensky got caught in the cargo net. Mm. So they got Smolensky out and down into the boat and we went ashore and into this sandy beach and we set up and now we didn't have any food and we had to scrounge whatever we could I remember from going around different guys trying to get this or that and uh, Olin our food down south and in, in, uh, in, in around in the night time there our, our food was sea rations but uh, the distribution took place by the sea rations lying along the road and you'd pick up whatever can you wanted and stuff it in your jacket pocket. And that was the way you collected food. And I remember my favorite was spaghetti. Um, <coughs> but back up north anyhow at Wonsan, when we, the word went around within an hour or so that Bob Hope was in a hangar over here at an airfield and he was putting on a show and uh, we dropped everything and our, we went about a quarter mile and I remember I've got a, there's I got pictures somewhere of that airfield with burned out planes and all that stuff on it and there's a hangar there broken up if I remember <coughs> but still partially standing and uh, we went up there and here's uh, Bob Hope on the stage with Jerry Colonna, Francis Langford, and he's putting on a show. And uh, in later years, Bob Hope used to brag about the fact that he had beaten the Marines into North Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did so. Uh, I remember just before he died, when he was in his last illness, I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, I said, thanks for the memorial that stuff. And I said, oh, that would have been one of the group there that saw your show at Wonsan. And I got a reply back from one of his assistants uh, thanking me for the letter and telling me that uh, he always appreciated that. And he always joked about having been there ahead of the Marines. So. Uh, we stayed at Wonsan. We set up on a peninsula. There was no firing going on. Uh, the Marines had moved, the, the division Marines had been moving north. And we had, we stayed at Wonsan in a little peninsula of pine trees and uh, set up our pyramid tents and we were living in pyramid tents. And it was getting cold. I remember because we had those little, the army or whoever it was had, this, had these little oil stoves that had one round, looked like a five gallon uh, can, a five gallon tub or, and then on top of it had a little device on top of it and then an oil tank and this device was supposed to control the flow and you were and you burned the oil and that gave you heat in your tent. But the, oil, the stoves never worked. They always would blow up. Whenever one would get going and you think you got something going, there'd be a big puff and black smoke would go up all, all over the place. So they were never satisfactory. Uh, we remained in that area <clears throat> for probably a week. And it was getting near the first of November. And uh, we were getting further north into Korea. We were now up at Hung Nam, H-U-N-G-N-A-M, uh, which is a port city. And we were in that city and it was all burned out, factories, everything was destroyed, all ruins. And the, the Marine Division had moved further up and they were moving up to the reservoir, the chosen reservoir. And uh, that reservoir, and then we moved up into a city called Ham Hung, H-A-M-H-U-N-G, which is inland from Hung Nam. And we set up there and we waited, we were there 
when the uh, uh, so-called retreat began, when the Chinese came in. The Chinese came in when the Marines were up on the south end of the reservoir at a place called Hagaruri, I think. Was it. But I wasn't up there. We were back about 20 miles. But I remember it being very cold, bitterly cold, bitterly cold. And did you have uh, winter gear at that time, or were you still in summer uniform? They had, there were parkas around. I remember. I don't think I had a park. I had. Uh, we would probably. I don't recall, but I think we had the green. We had somehow had acquired our green wool uniform. That's so we had green wool pants and uh, uh, shirts of wool shirts. I don't remember ever having a parka. Parkers were around, and I don't know what I had. Um, How about the boots, the insulated boots? <laughs> that was a joke, I thought, because down south we had worn what we called boondockers. Those were the uh, leather ankle height boots. Yeah. And they were good. Uh, the Boondocker was a good shoe and never had any problem with it. But when we went up north, they issued, I remember having a boot that looked like a L.L. Bean boot. Just like an L.L. Bean boot, if I recall. It had the rubber sole and the rubber top, or the rubber foot, and then it had a leather top on it. You didn't get the Mickey Mouse boots. We did not get the big monsters. No, the big black things. Yeah, the Mickey Mouse boots. No, we didn't get those. I remember seeing them at one time, but I don't remember having any. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they looked horrible, if I recall. They looked, as you say, like Mickey big Mouse and, boots. Big and bulky. Big and bulky. And I, I, well, cold feet were always a problem. And in fact, a lot of the people that came back, of course, from the, from the reservoir had frostbite of all sorts of different things. But our, uh, when they when they started coming back from the reservoir, we were at Hung, we went back to Hung Nam, and we were set up in Hung Nam, and we were living in the pyramid tents in a factory area right down by the by the uh, ocean by the. Harbor. I don't remember there being any piers or anything there. And the, uh, they put us on, we went aboard an LST. Uh, it seemed like there was chaos um, because I wasn't with my unit at all. I was with a buddy of mine named a Marine Sergeant. And we went on an LST. There must have been some other Marines there, though. And it was a Japanese LST. There was no food there. And they loaded on that LST every kind of a thing that you could imagine. They had fire trucks on there. They had jeeps and all sorts of different things. So I recall <laughs> there was no place that you could sit down or lay down or anything. And uh, Crum and I, that's the sergeant, we found a, a shower stall with a wooden deck on it. And we set up shop in the shower stall, and that's where we stayed. Uh, that, is, that is another panorama of that evacuation from Hung Nam. Did the Marine Corps destroy a lot of equipment? Let me, uh... Oh, yes, I guess they did. We must have been some of the first Marines out of there, because that evacuation went on for quite a while after we left. Uh, the uh, the scene, as I recall, is that, that there were mountains and an opening in mountains off to the west, and you could see the vehicles coming down, uh, and uh, then they'd come down to the port area, and it was just like a, a line of uh, every kind of a vehicle imaginable, and carrying troops. And I remember particularly that there was one of these box ambulances uh, that we used, a bigger ambulance, and it had the Red Cross on the side, and the Red Cross was full of bullet holes. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, we left on them, 
and we sailed down to Pusan. And the, uh, we, the LSD dropped its ramp on P at Pusan in the harbor, and they put off a, a guard detachment. And another fellow and myself, and I don't remember who he was, we decided that we'd had enough and we were going to do our own thing. So we marched off with the guards detachment and we jumped over a fence and we went into town. And we got a haircut and that was the first time I ever had a shave with an aerosol can. Hmm. And that had come into being at that time in a Korean barber shop. And then we knew that the ship was not going to remain in Pusan, it was going around to Maison. And we were going back to the bean patch, which is where the big field was at Maison. So uh, this other fellow and myself started, why we didn't carry our rifles or had any arms, I don't know. But anyhow, we, we walked out of Pusan, and I remember we got a ride with a, a couple Brits who were in a Jeep, and they drove us maybe halfway to Maison, and then we walked, and we were walking in the dark down these roads, and we were totally unarmed or whatever. And <coughs> I remember when we got to our unit, the Master Sergeant looked at us kind of funny, and where the hell have you been? And we said, well, we've been around, Sarge, yeah. So we never were disciplined for that or anything. And uh, I remained at, Mason. And come uh, January, and uh, it was either February, I think, uh, a rumor started going around, and we were in the bean patch there. We were, we were living in a building, actually. And one funny incident was that the word went around amongst, I was assigned to a group of Marines. One funny incident was that their word went around that they were the officers were to come and confiscate all 45 automatics they found, mm -hmm. and every every marine in my had a 45 automatic, <laughs> and so they decided my peers there decided that well hell they won't search the corpsman, so all the 45s that these guys had went on under my sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. And that's where I slept on their 45s, and so they were all able to preserve their 45s. They didn't, nobody found them. Because Corbin weren't supposed to be uh, armed. So we were they, immune or something, I don't yeah. know. Uh, but anyhow, uh, while we were there, uh, uh, a rumor started going around that our, our doctor, our chief doctor, that would be the red, who, first had been the brigade surgeon and then was with the division. He would be a Navy captain, a physician, regular Navy captain, doctor. So he would have been a World War II type also. By the way, all of our NCOs, I think, were World War II. Uh, I can't think of any that wouldn't have been World War II. Um, word went around that he had arranged to have all of the brigade corpsmen shipped back to the States. And, you know, you you put those things aside, you know, oh, who started that one? You know, that's a dirty rumor to start. And that, I think about a week went by, and it began to take form. It began to have legs, as they say. And uh, sure enough, uh, I, uh, according to the story, what the doctor had, contacted the Bureau of Naval Personnel and arranged to have the brigade corpsmen, those who had been with the brigade at first, sent back to the States. And uh, I don't know, the number 57 keeps ringing in my mind. I don't know if that was the number of corpsmen who were with the brigade originally or those who were, were still with, still there. Uh, I know some of them had been lost. But, uh, I recall a good buddy of mine, uh, a fellow named Skelly from Boston, got hit by uh, an artillery. But uh, orders came, and back we went. Uh, we first we got on a, a C. Uh, what would they be? That 
the playing the, the workhorse of the of at the time two engine Douglas DC three had a bunch of Turkish soldiers on it I recall and I remember getting on that and they flew us over to some place in Japan and then I think we went by train or truck and we were up at Yokosuka Japan and uh, and then we went by truck over to Haneda Airport in Tokyo and uh, the days in between we may have been a few days in each one of those locations but I do recall that Chief Gomez who had been a chief on Guam with us but who had not I had not seen since Guam he uh, was very intoxicated at the time the plane was scheduled to leave and I remember he had a uh, what do they call them? sea chest or a locker box a locker box foot I guess. locker foot locker yeah. that he had with filled with whiskey and, <laughs> and they had the strap the pilot didn't want to take him and they had to strap him in I think they strapped him in the head for takeoff and uh, we went back and we, that was that. We stopped at Kwajalein uh, and then we flew on to uh, the Naval Air Station and, uh, at, in Hawaii, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, Did you get to Pearl Harbor on the way back? I don't remember ever seeing Pearl Harbor, uh, we must have been near it. But, the only thing I remember about Hawaii was that they had a hell of a slop shoot. I mean, they had we drank milkshakes until they were coming out of our ears. <laughs> Hamburgers and milkshakes. You didn't have R and R in Japan? No. 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 And then uh, that was the end of Korea. We came back. I remember we were a scraggly group. We went to a Navy receiving station because we were Navy. Uh, and the Naval Receiving Station at Treasure Island in San Francisco. But we had on uh, green pants, and some had khaki shirts, some had the wool shirts. Uh, we, it's a mixture of Marine uniforms, right? And they they couldn't couldn't, couldn't figure out what the hell to make of us there. I remember. <laughs> and that was that was that. Then uh, you were discharged when you came back from, from Korea? I worked at Great Lakes, went back to dear old Great Lakes for another year. And because Truman, uh, on the way over to Korea, I remember, there was a lot of talk and I remember my thinking was, hell, why am they sending me over here? Because I've only got another six months to do. Put freeze on. And uh, I'll be discharged. This is a foolish to send me all the way over here when I'm going to be coming to come right back. And then about halfway over, why Truman extended everybody's enlistment for, for a year. year. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's a dirty trick, huh? <laughs> so I served out the year and then I was discharged at Great Lakes Hill. Yeah. But then you ran into the reserve, reserve. Well, Korea had, a, had an effect on me. Uh, I was burning to get some education. I had a, a I had a burning desire to, uh, to I don't know what, but to get educated somehow. And so I uh, uh, and I had the GI Bill, of course. Right. So I went down to Wayne, and uh, Wayne accepted me, and then they were kind enough to give a whole bunch of. Uh, uh, tests, proficiency tests of veterans, right. so that you could pick up credits. And God, I picked up 16 credits or something, and a whole semester's credits or a year's credits. Very good. And uh, so I graduated from Wayne in '57, and then I immediately enrolled at Wayne Law School and graduated there in '60. So. Very good. Meanwhile, I had worked as a Detroit cop for three years. Uh, I had worked at Dodge, Maine for a little while. Uh, what else? I drove a checker cab in Detroit when I first got out of the Navy. Uh, <laughs> then you went back into the uh, reserve. Yeah, there was a... Uh, I, 
I couldn't get the Navy out of my... Uh, I don't know. Was, you got your commission though, right? I had, I went downtown to the Navy office in the Federal Building and I uh, found out that I could get a direct commission into the reserves. And uh, there was a law company in Detroit uh, consisting of lawyers in that downtown area that met once a month up on the top of the Buell building in a restaurant for the for the drill. The drill was going to launch once a month. So I joined that unit and uh, that was 1960s, no, I was commissioned, hell I don't remember, uh, but I was with that unit at the time and I was practicing downtown in Detroit and the uh, Vietnam War started and I got up my adventurous spirit again and I started thinking Navy mm -hmm. and uh, my wife said, you better not. <laughs> and, uh, I said, well, I think I will. And so I went down to uh, one of my other members of the unit down there, Judge Ryan, uh, who was on circuit court bench at the time. And I talked to him about it. And we had also gone on training duty out in different places and I kind of liked the idea. So uh, 1970, why I got a recall to active duty mm -hmm. and with the uh, Judge Advocate General Corps. Very good. I went to I remember going to Washington, meeting the admiral, and, you know, and, and uh, he said, "Well, we can find a place for you." Mm -hmm. So uh, that was that, and we stayed in the uh, Navy, and the wife loved it after a while. And I grew to love it. And we remained with the Navy until August 1989. And uh, then became a civilian again. And you retired at what rank? Captain. Captain. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. They never found me out. <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds as, as if you've had a wonderful experience serving your country. Yes. You never talked about your wound, and I see that, that you were injured in the service. That you got oh a no, that that's uh, that's hearing loss. Oh. Yeah. That's. Uh, I, I, what, that, I was on an aircraft carrier. Yeah. I don't uh, for a couple of years, and I don't know. What it had to do with it, but it turned out I had a hearing loss. I see. No, oh, I remember getting my thumb cut once in Korea. <laughs> How did you find the food? The marine food was a little strictly rationed, or did they feed you pretty well when you were in, oh, when you were in combat conditions? The, year, the calendar year 1949, we were on Guam at uh, Camp Weetek. They got blown away by a typhoon. But uh, we starved on Guam. You couldn't get enough food anywhere. They, they wouldn't give you seconds on anything. And uh, rations were, I always complained about it anyhow. And then in Korea, uh, it was, uh, I don't know, sea rations. Uh, did you eat any of the na native food, any of the kimchi or any of that stuff? No, sir. No, oh, sir. Would you go hear that stuff? I, I heard a lot smell of smell. It permeates everything, but <laughs> no, the smell is there. The fertilized rice paddies weren't any. Yeah, any well, they called those fellows the honey, honey dippers. Honey dippers. Right. Yes. Uh huh. They were another thing. They fertilize the rice paddies. Right. Rice paddies. Yeah. But I, the one the one effect that Korea had on I me mean, turned me around. Uh, I came out a you went different in a, person. A, a boy who came out a man. Yeah, I think so. Uh, because I was just hell bent on getting an education. I figured that was the only way out. And you, did you practice law in the Michigan area, in oh, the yeah. Detroit area? Oh yeah, Detroit, and then uh, 
out in Warren for a while. Were you with a firm? I was one of those who was by myself. Okay. I, I was a magistrate out in uh, Shelby Township, and then we, when I went back in the Navy. Uh, three. But, uh, right. And then I practiced for ten years. We did have the last three minutes on the tape. Okay. Okay. Did you want to add anything to the conversation? Um, not, not really. Do you have, uh, you have children? I have two. Two children? Uh, a boy and a girl. Okay. Both, both married. And one in Fairfax, Virginia, and the other's in Durham, North Carolina. Yeah. And they were, uh, when you went back into the Navy, how old were they? My boy was uh, two years old, and my daughter hadn't been born. She was born in the Navy. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think they enjoyed it. I hope they did. Uh, we didn't uh, move that much. We were at Norfolk for five years. I was on a ship there for two years. And uh, we went to Orlando, Florida for two and a half years. Then we came to Washington, D.C., and we were there for the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Well, thank you for your service. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Very interesting interview. I found somebody who finally yeah. could listen to my stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, thanks for listening to it. <laughs>